Hi Speedy Readsters, and now I assume you're here to hear a little bit more about Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Uh, because last time we got up to p -p 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 page 73 and uh, they were just about to go shopping. So let's find out what on earth is going down. Uh, let me just get my stopwatch because we only have 15 minutes. Um, 15 minutes starting from now. For a famous place, it was a very dark and shabby place. Sorry, it was very dark and shabby. All right. A few old women were sitting in a corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old barman, who was quite bold and looked like a grumpy walnut, like a gummy walnut. The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him, and the barman reached for a glass, saying, The usual, Hagrid. Can't, Tom. I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping his great hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good Lord, said the barman, peering at Harry. Is this... can this be... The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old barman. Harry Potter, what an honour. He hurried out from behind the bar, rushed towards Harry and seized his hand, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr Potter, welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realising it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs and, next moment, Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr Potter, can't believe I'm meeting you at last. Uh, Doris Crockford, oh, OK, I see, I see what's going on here. Doris Crockford, Mr Potter, can't believe I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I'm just so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. Oh, I'm all of a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just can't tell you. Uh, Diggle's the name. Dead. Dedalus Diggle. Dedalus. Dedalus Diggle. I've seen you before, said Harry, as Dedalus Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. You bowed to me once in a shop. He remembers, cried Dedalus Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockford kept coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p -p potter stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping Harry's hand. C can't tell you how p -p pleased I am to meet you. What sort of magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? Defence against the d -d -d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. N not that you n n need it, uh, eh, P -p -p Potter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g got to p pick up a new book on vampires myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took almost ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the babble. Must get on. Lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Off they go. Doris Crockford shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard, where there was nothing but a dustbin and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you he was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Mind you, he's usually trembling. Is he always that nervous? Oh, yeah, poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest and there was a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of the students? Scared of his own subject? Uh, nay, where's me umbrella? Vampires? Hags? Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the dustbin. Three up. Two across, he muttered. Right, stand back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had touched quivered. It wriggled. In the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway large enough even for Hagrid. An archway onto a cobbled street which twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. 
He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into the solid wall. The sun shone brightly on a stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons, all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, said, said a sign hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we've got to get your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. A plump woman outside in apothecaries was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Dragon liver, sixteen sickles an ounce, they're mad. A low, loft, uh, sorry, a low soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sign saying, Eyelops, Owl Emporium, <clears throat> Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against a window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes and strange silver instruments. Harry had never seen before, windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eels' eyes, tottering piles of spell books, quills and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building which towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished bronze doors, wearing a uniform of scarlet and gold, was... Yeah, that's a goblin said Hagrid quietly as they walked up the white stone steps towards him. The goblin was about a uh, the goblin was about a head shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with words engraved upon them. It said this Enter, stranger, but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief you have been warned beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad to try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed, <coughs> bowed them through the silver doors and they were in a vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins on brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the hall, and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Morning, said Hagrid to a free goblin. We have come to take some money out of Mr. Potter's safe. You have his key, sir. Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, and he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of mouldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right, weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be in order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore said Hagrid, importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about the you-know-what in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take you down to both vaults. Griphook? Griphook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Griphook towards one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you-know-what in Vault 713, Harry asked. I can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trust in me. More than my job's worth to tell of that. Griphook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marble, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downwards and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Griphook whistled and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks towards them. They climbed in. Hagrid with some difficulty and then were off. At first they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember. Left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Griphook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once, he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of the passage and twisted around to see if it was the dragon, but too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. 
I never know, Harry called to Hagrid over the noise of the card. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? Stalagmite's got a minute, said Hagrid. And don't ask me questions now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green, and when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in a passage, uh, in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees trembling. Grip Hook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came tumbling, uh, came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this, or they'd have had it, or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often they complained how much Harry cost them to keep, and all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep underneath London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. A gold one to galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon, and twenty-nine nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Right, that should be enough for a couple of turns. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Grip Hook. Grip Hook, sorry. Vault 713 now, please. And can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled round tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine and Harry leant over the side to try and see what was down at the dark bottom. But Hagrid groaned and pulled him back, pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Grip Hook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Grip Hook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Grip Hook with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault. Harry was sure, and he leant forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first, he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but knew better than to ask. <sighs> Come on back, come on, back in this infernal cart, and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One wild cart, one wild, well, here we are. One wild cart ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first, now that he had bags full of money. He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to a pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd ever had in his whole life. More money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniform, said Hagrid, nodding towards Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you mind if I slipped off and picked me up in the leaky cauldron? I ate them Gringotts carrots. He did still look a bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Malkin's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Malkin was a squat, smiling witch dressed in mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here. Another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of a shop, a boy with a pale, pointed face was standing on a f uh, pointed face was standing on a footstool, while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame Malkin stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a long robe over his head, and began it began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too. Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying books, and mother's up the street looking at ones, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off to look at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting me one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom? the boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all? No, Harry said again, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to play for my house, and I must say I agree. Know what house you'll be in yet? No, said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin. All of my family have been. Imagine being in Hufflepuff. <laughs> I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. 
Oh, uh, I say, look at that man, said the boy suddenly, nodding towards the front of the window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. Oh, that's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy, I've heard of him. He's a sort of servant, isn't he? He's the gamekeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I've heard he's a sort of savage, lives in a hut in the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk, tries to be magic and ends up setting fire to his bed. Well, I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Stop that noise! I'll finish the sentence. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? Dun dun dun, dot dot dot, mark it in the book. So, we've learnt a little bit there. He's been at the bank, he's getting all his kit for school, and he's met this rather snotty-nosed kid. I wonder if they will be in the same form. Who knows? But, uh, thanks for joining me, and we're making our way, inch by inch, further into Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So, join me next time, and we can read some more together. All right, cheerio. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>